Energy service is a rapidly growing trend in the United States, less so in Canada. And in this interview, I'm going to be talking to Kirk Edelman, who is the CEO of U.S.-based Soul Microgrid, whose company creates independent microgrids for commercial and industrial customers at no upfront cost. So welcome to the interview, Kirk. Thanks for having me, Markham. I want to frame this uh, a little differently than I have in the past, because you're not the first energy as a service company that we've interviewed. But over, in 2025 particular, particularly, the uh, projected uh, load growth on the power grid is through the roof. We're, you know, 3%, 4%, even 5% in some states and regions. And uh, big uh, industrial customers, commercial customers are really worried that they're not going to have reliable uh, low cost electricity, and they're turning to the kinds of solutions that your company offers. And is that a kind of a fair summary of where we're at in the United States right now? You know, I think so, Markham. I think there's a couple of trends that are, are causing uh, interest in this kind of space. You know, I think there's, I, you know, I often talk to people, I say there's three things that we all see in our day to day life that are that are hard to argue. You know, clearly the world is going towards electricity uh, being the primary source of, of energy. Everything's being electrified, automobiles, so all, you name it, it's being electrified. Second, you know, the grid in North America is, is underinvested. You know, it, it, it is somewhat fragile. It has a, a, a number of choke points. That's not going to change overnight. And finally, the third given is it clearly the weather, weather events are becoming more severe. So you have those three trends, hard to argue. You can argue what's causing them, but let's, let's assume that's all a given. I think the conclusion from that is power outages are going to become more commonplace. And if that's the case, I think that in itself helps cause people to kind of shift and focus on, on microgrids as a, as a solution. Maybe if you could just tell us uh, the approach that you take and what a microgrid is within that context. Yeah, you know, uh, what, what, what's a microgrid? You know, it, it, all sorts of different definitions, but I, I think definitely it's, it's sort of a, a small electrical grid with defined boundaries. It can operate synchronized with the, the, the main grid or it can operate on its own uh, in an island mode. It's made up of uh, distributed energy resources or DER components, uh, and it's really designed to provide reliable, resilient power, uh, particularly when it's operating in island mode. Some purists would argue that if your system does not have full resiliency, then it's technically not a microgrid. So to those people, I tell them I'm really a, a DER developer, uh, not a microgrid developer. Oh, fair enough. There are purists everywhere. And uh, so one of the uh, things I took from your uh, from your company's press release was, and this, I think, sums it up nice. Energy as a service converts energy from a CapEx extent intensive utility metered commodity into an outcome based subscription. And maybe you could explain that for my viewers. Yeah, you know, I, I, I tell people that really energy as a service, customers pay for what they use. Uh, now, I know I think that's an insurance industry jingle somewhere that you see on television every night, but you really pay for what you use. It, it eliminates the CapEx. You know, we provide it on an as a service. So to your point, it takes CapEx, it converts it more into an OpEx decision, which by the way, typically you don't have to go to your board to get approval and you don't have to worry about return on the project, which often trips up a lot of great energy projects. Um, but really it, it makes microgrids more accessible. Uh, it reduces financial barriers. Uh, it ensures long-term savings and sustainability. And, and going back to what I said a few minutes ago, I think those are things that address the concerns that you know a large number of people out there have right now. There's another angle to this that really uh, I run into a lot, and that is it shifts the risk from the uh, the business owner who is not in the business of uh, you know managing an energy company, you, you, asking them to install solar, install all the equipment, and then manage it is 
too much for for many uh, for many businesses. But it so it shifts that risk over to your company. But you do have that expertise, and you do bring the capital. Uh, so it doesn't cost them anything up front. And you you take that on your balance sheet and they don't have to take it on their balance sheet. And it's that shifting of risk in this equation uh, that I think is really the uh, your killer app, as it were. Yeah, no, I agree. You said it, you know, really well. You know, a lot of people want the benefits of what we offer, but they don't want to go into the energy business. And I don't blame them. If you're not in the energy business, it's not easy to to, to get your head around you're only paying for what you use. There's no CapEx and we uh, offer you OPEX savings. So a lot of times when I'm explaining this to new customers, they say, wait a minute, this sounds like all good things. You know, what's, what's the hitch? You know, what aren't you telling me? And um, I tell them, hey, listen, you don't have to be an owner. You don't have to worry about routine maintenance, planned, unplanned outages, monitoring, none of that. However, um, you know, these are longer term relationships. Our energy as a service agreement has to have a longer tenor because we need the time to generate enough value that we give the customer savings. And we have time to to get our capital investment back with a, a reasonable rate of return. Yeah, and I think that's uh, a fair, uh, you know, of all of the, the uh, if I was looking for a wart, uh, in your business model, the length of the agreement, which could be anywhere from 5, 10, 15, even 20 years, uh, would probably be it. But then, you know what? On the other hand, I, and I don't know what it's like in the United States, but in most Canadian provinces, there is only one utility. There is only one provider. So even though you may pay month to month, uh, you are locked in with that utility uh, as long as your business is, is open. If you're a customer, as long as you won't, you know, have a house, live in an apartment building, you're paying to that utility. So how much of a consideration uh, is that for, you know, the length of the contract? How much of a consideration is it for customers? Yeah, no, it's, you know, we, we try not to surprise anybody. When you, when you deal with us, we lay it all out on the line. We're very transparent. We, we calculate monthly in the bill to our customer exactly what value we created, what were the savings, and we show you exactly how much we took and how much you get. So we're on the same side of the table. The more we can save for you, the better we both uh, are at the end of the month. You know, it is longer tenors, as I said. Uh, you know, we do have to be concerned about counterparty risk, performance risk. You know, is our customer going to be around for that period of time? If, if they're not, now, you know, you'll probably smile when I say this, but we do have early termination fees. So if a customer wants out, uh, right up front from day one, we, we give them a schedule of what our early termination fees are, and they can, they can see that. There's, you know, we don't hide anything. Uh, but at the end of the day, I, what I try to point out to people is really the risk is asymmetrical. Think about it. If, if we blow up, if for some reason we disappear, the customer, Customer goes back to uh, basically buying its power from its local utility, and they no longer get the savings that we were providing them. So they're going to miss out on future savings. If our customer <laughs> blows up, you know we may not get our capital back. We're definitely not going to get our return on capital, and we may have significant operating expenses that we end up having to eat. So I think we have a lot more at risk than our typical customer, but we're willing to take that risk. Right, and as, and you're willing to do it because that's your business. You know how to manage risk exactly. in a way that the customer wouldn't. There's another risk here that I think we need to talk about. That you know, if I was a business owner and you approached me with this, I would say, well, what happens if we have a really cloudy month and there's you know our, the solar system doesn't uh, perform as expected, and in fact, it lo you, you know this lo agreement loses money, but you but you pay that right. Th that's right. I mean, basically, if we don't create value, they don't get the savings, uh, and, and and neither do we. But again, it's it, if they expected $100 of savings and we had a very poor solar month, maybe they get $80 worth of savings. They still got savings. Uh, they're not going to get negative savings. Uh, so that's the that's basically the uh, insulation risk you take in the in the solar business. Kirk. Um, we've talked about all the good stuff around this business model. And I really like this. And I, <clears throat> we first did our, I think we did our first interview 
about energy as a service oh four or five years ago. So it's been around for a while. Um, tell us why, when a, if you walk into a customer's office and they say, you know what, I'm not interested in this, what would their reasons be? You know, sometimes it's as simple as the juice ain't worth the squeeze. You, you know, uh, there is a lot of um, mystery around electricity, around TV solar, around batteries. There's a lot of concern about batteries. They're all well known. You know, some people get concerned about putting solar on their property, about potentially putting a battery energy storage system on their property. And, and we get that. They might say, Kirk, you're telling me you're going to save me 15% uh, you know, every month. You know, how is that versus this perceived risk of having a battery in a container uh, in my parking lot? You know, so you run into that sometimes. You know, I think those risks are, are, are very mitigated, but nonetheless, they are risks. Um, but, you know, that typically isn't, isn't the, the big issue. A lot of times it's, it's just simply, do I want to go through the, the headache of, of having this project put on the property? Uh, and are the savings commensurate with that headache? Let me uh, give you our take on this here at Energy Media, because we actually have a little model we use when we do our, you know, our, our journalism. And there are four uh, uh, criteria that consumers of any kind evaluate when they go, when they're thinking about buying something, you know, like an, uh, an energy technology. First one is CapEx. And we, you've talked about this with capital expenditure. What is my purchase price? The second is oper OPEX. Operating expenditure. What does it cost me to operate that thing? The the third is risk. How risky is this? And risk is a perception. So it could have the same business in the same location, etc. And one manager will, or or business owner will perceive the risk as high, and another one will perceive it as low because it's very personal. The third thing is value. And this is kind of the X factor here because, you know, there are all sorts of non-economic values. You know, if you walk into my office and I say, oh, you know what? I'm not going to, I don't have to worry now about buying em, uh, emissions intense electricity. And that's important to me. But the next guy, it might not be important to. You can't put a dollar figure on that. So those are all those four criteria that people evaluate when they're making purchase decisions. And I would argue that since I first started doing these interviews four or five years ago, is that the calculation of those criteria is moving more and more and rapidly in the direction of favoring your business model, the energy as a service, in particular as these risk, other risk factors like uh, grid resiliency, grid reliability, and costs come more to come to the fore. No, you're you're absolutely right. And the trends are heading in our direction, to be honest with you. You know, five, six years ago, we were installing 300 watt modules, monofacial uh, technology. And now that for the same price, we can put in a 600 watt class bifacial, uh, get a whole lot more value, uh, maybe even cheaper uh, upfront costs. When you look at batteries, gosh, the, the price has come way down. And with the price coming down, we didn't, as an industry, just a few years ago, we didn't have the really smart uh, energy management systems to get the most value out of a microgrid. Just in the last two or three years, we have third parties who have developed sophisticated tools, which end up being the brains of our system. And they allow you to put a, a, a storage system in one of these microgrids and really enhance the value you create by using the DER components in an optimal manner, optimal manner. And, and that's, it's amazing how quickly that technology has progressed. So today a microgrid has a lot more to offer than it did even just three years ago. Uh, let's wrap up the interview this way, Kirk. Um, tell me what are the top one, two, maybe three, but uh, barriers to adoption of your, of energy as a service, cost, risk, OPEC, what, what, what might it be? From the customer's perspective or from my perspective? Well, let's talk about it from your perspective. Yeah. You know, you, you, we've already hit on them a little bit. It's a longer tenored um, business model. And with that in mind, you know, looking at and assessing counterparty risk, counterparty performance is, is, is very, very important. Um, 
just the financial risk of uh, inflation over a long period of time versus what we're pegging our revenue to. We typically, with a customer, guarantee a savings versus their current month's uh, power. So we are we are in line with whichever direction power prices are going in that particular market. So I think that's a nice mitigant. Uh, but when you look at these longer tendered arrangements, you know people are get, are concerned that wait a minute, a good deal today is that going to be a good as good a deal uh, tomorrow? I think our our model mitigates that pretty nicely, but it's something we have to talk about. I think the third big thing, to be honest with you, Markham is. When we talk about creating value, in order to show accurately the value a microgrid creates, you have to understand uh, not only the, the power industry in general, but the specific tariff that the site is operating under. So it's a particular uh, utility service territory and a particular tariff in that territory. And they, as you know, uh, over North America, they vary from you know all different flavors. So for us, we have to become experts on the, the PG&E B10 tariff versus the PG&E you know, B18 tariff. And with that in mind, then we have to, have to turn around and explain to our customer, hey, this is how you're currently paying for your power. And this is how we can show you that you're going to benefit from, from what we're offering you today. But step one, usually for us, is educating a customer often very sophisticated customers, how their own tariff is currently operating and how they're billed for power long before we showed up. Kirk, my takeaway from that comment is that basically now the technology is competitive, viable, and ready for scale up. And really now what it comes down to is the execution by companies like yourself to be able to go in and address those very technical questions that come up in any sales call. You know, the customer wants data, they want case studies, they want how we, they're gonna have all kinds of objections and questions. That's part of business. But if you're at that point now where those are the kinds of questions you ask, you're you're past the inflection point. You're you're on the exponential curve going up. And is now it's a question of, you know, how the technology performs, how you perform. So I, I think I'm a big fan of energy as a service, particularly for the commercial sector in North America, because our grids are not in the great, not in the greatest shape, and they need this kind of technology in order to maintain, you know, reliability and and lower costs. So this has been a great, lots of insights in this interview. Thank you very much, Kirk. Thank you, Markham.